Freedom from Religion. That was fun doing that song. Uh, the song is called Freedom from Religion, and that was the tag ending. Uh, it was fun having an atheist backup choir on a recording studio, Freedom from Religion. So welcome uh, again to another weekly episode of the Freedom from Religion Foundation's Ask an Atheist on Facebook Live. I'm Dan Barker. I'm co-president of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, which produces this weekly show. And speaking of producers, uh, we do have a kind of a skeleton crew. Um, Bruce Johnson is our video. Can you guys say hi? Are you in the studio there? Hi, Bruce. Uh, Bruce has been doing our video. And then there's Buzz Kemper, the, the famous voice deity, Buzz Kemper. Um, a lot of the music uh, that you hear on this show and other shows is produced in Buzz Kemper's studio. It's called uh, Audio for the Arts there in Madison, Wisconsin. So you guys have been vaccinated, right? You're, you're there in the studio together. Um, yeah, we've been in the same bubble pretty much all the way along because we work together on other projects as, as well. We see each other. Yeah, well, time. you're both. You're both still alive, even though I called you a skeleton crew. <laughs> no, I'm far bigger than a skeleton. I was going to say, I need to lose some weight if it's going to yeah. be. <laughs> well, well, thanks for doing all this. Thanks for coming in. We're gradually going to start reopening the office, including the studio there. And we also have, not on, on video, but we also have Lauren Searing, who's helping us with production behind the scenes as well today. So hi, Lauren, if you're watching here. So today, uh, we're going to show you something that happened last week. Last week, on our episode of Ask an Atheist, we announced a significant legal victory by the Freedom From Religion Foundation, dealing with the So Help Me God oath that the citizens of Alabama were forced to sign in order to register to vote. We won that case, and it's a great story. Unfortunately, Last week, due to a technical problem with Facebook Live, that show was not able to be aired live. And, of course, you could see it later um, on, um, on YouTube and that. Uh, so you couldn't ask questions during that, that show. So we're going to see it again today. And if you do have questions during today's show, you can post them in the Facebook comments or whatever you call the chat down at the bottom of the Facebook. Or you can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. Uh, so, but before we go to Alabama, our attorneys have been really busy all over the country. If you listen to our radio show or read our newspaper, Free Thought Today, you see that we're complaining about religious bills and religious activities in many states around the country. Just recently, just this week, the governor of North Dakota signed into law a bill uh, allowing the posting of the Ten Commandments in all public schools in that state. So we are complaining about it, and we are hoping to find plaintiffs. If you live in North Dakota, if you have a child in the school or your family with um, relatives in the school, uh, and you'd like to complain about this unconstitutional preference of one religion in the public schools, then contact us. You can visit our website and then look at the drop-down menu that says... Um, uh, make a complaint or whatever it says, you can send a legal complaint to us and uh, you might want to help us complain or even join in the lawsuit, assuming that we're able to go to court on that issue. The Supreme Court has said that the Ten Commandments in the public schools are re pure religion and it's purely wrong. So we'll be talking more about that later. And then over in Tennessee, the uh, there's been a resolution passed, uh, it's, still in, it's still in the Congress, to allow uh, to turn uh, the Bible into the state book of Tennessee. And uh, Annie Laurie Gaylor, who's co-president with me of FFRF, she wrote an op-ed that was printed in Tennessee newspaper this week. So we'll be watching that issue as well. It seems like the religious right is just, they're never going to give up. They, they feel hopeful now that there is a more conservative Supreme Court. So uh, they probably even know that groups like ours are going to sue them. And uh, if we can, then, of course, we will, because we care about the First Amendment. We care about true American values, the freedom to think for ourselves without the government imposing or interfering with our religious views. But let's go to Alabama now. So the Alabama voting oath, um, you, we're going to watch last week's show and the host of the show about this Alabama voting oath are Elizabeth Cavell and Patrick Elliott, and they are constitutional attorneys here at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. They also had a special guest, 
Randall Cragen. He's a professor who was the lead plaintiff in that Alabama case, which we won. And then, so we'll watch that. And then after the show, hang on, uh, I'll be able to come back and answer, hopefully answer some of your questions, because I supposedly know everything. Uh, and then I'll tell you about what's coming up on other shows as well. So let's, uh, let's watch uh, Liz Cavell and Patrick Elliott about the Alabama oath to register to vote. Welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Liz Cavell, Associate Counsel here at FFRF. And I'm Patrick Elliott, Senior Lit Litigation Counsel at FFRF. So on today's show, we are going to talk about religious oaths and an FFRF lawsuit that was recently successful in challenging Alabama's religious oath requirement for its voter registration. Uh, Patrick was lead counsel on the case uh, in-house, and we worked uh, with an Alabama attorney as well. We're joined today by our lead plaintiff in that case, Randy Cragen. Welcome, Randy. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. And if you, viewer, have any questions during this conversation for any of us, ask them in the Facebook comments, or you can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. And uh, Randy is our—we uh, know him th through as a lead plaintiff. Um, he's a professor of economics at uh, Birmingham Southern Uni College, if I have that right. And uh, you've became involved in an issue, a state church issue, and um, kind of hoping you could kind of take us through uh, that process. I know you had recently uh, moved to Alabama and were looking to register to vote. And if you could just kind of let us know what you found in doing so. Sure. Uh, so I moved to Alabama a year and a half ago, and I went to register to vote. And I found that I, I filled out the paper form because I didn't have an Alabama license, so I couldn't do the online form. So it was already uh, a little difficult. But then I got to the end, and I there was an oath. And I I think most people probably don't read it, but I, I guess I'm obsessive about some things, and I. Notice that at the end it was asking me to swear essentially to a god, and I wasn't willing to do that. Uh, so I, oh, sorry, continue. Oh, just, I, you know, we have noted kind of, you know, not only, you know, is there an oath portion, but it kind of tells you the penalty, um, you know, <laughs> for perjury right there. If you falsely sign the statement, you can be convicted and imprisoned for up to five years. So that's right on the uh, you know, right, confronting people who are registering to vote, uh, you know, which would, which uh, I could see why, um, you know, for some voters, that would be a little shocking to see when you're about to, um, you know, sign that statement. Sure. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think the, the personal conviction was probably more important than a threat of punishment. Uh, I care more about being an honest person and, and, approaching my world with uh, responsibility, I guess, then that, I, I mean, I, I doubt it's very likely that people were being prosecuted for, for signing that as far as I know, but that wasn't a big concern to me, I guess, more that this is something I don't believe and I'm not willing to espouse it as a prerequisite for voting was my concern. So what did you do? So you have this paper form, you're trying to register to vote. What was your plan to try and register without swearing? Uh, my first thought was to just cross it out, and I almost just did that. Uh, but then I contacted, I tried to contact a local elections board, and I didn't really get any responses. Still, it's been a year and a half. I hadn't really thought about that until now. Uh, and then I, I checked with someone in the elections office and asked at the state level if I could cross it out, if there was some alternative forms, because I had looked online and found out that courts had sort of dealt with this before, and there were supposed to be alternative forms for people who uh, objected to that. And then I got this response from the director of elections saying that, no, there was no alternative, and my application would be rejected if I crossed anything out and made any modifications. So then I started looking for attorneys. And uh, it took a long time, and eventually FFRF was helpful enough to participate in this and to help. So, Patrick, what happened next? 
Well, you know, we had heard not just from Randy, but from some other um, contacts in the state, um, which was, I guess, just coincidental um, <clears throat> that they were around the same period in time that this voter uh, oath issue had come up because people had started to to see it. Um, you know, we we did a little research into this and found Alabama was the only state in the country that has a any religious language on a you know on any voter registration documents or or forms. Um, so so we wrote to the Secretary of State's office, which which is the office designated with creating these forms, and pointed out that there has to be some mechanism for people to register to vote without um, a required religious oath. Um, there must be some alternative. And, uh, you know, we didn't hear back, uh, which, as Liz, as you know, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, these government officials uh, don't hear back right away. Or in this case, when we did hear back, um, they basically indicated that there wasn't going to be a change because this was what was required in Alabama. And so, um, you know, at that point, uh, we had to determine whether it's something that we could litigate. And, you know, I think the the cases are quite strong on this issue of, you know, voters, um, basically, you know, a government can't coerce someone into making a religious statement. Um, even if there is a an oath for an office or something, there must be some kind of secular affirmation um, provided if somebody requests it. And so, you know, we, um, you know, Liz and I were co-counsel on this case with, with um, uh, a local attorney, and really it was, um, we, we went forward with, with Randy as the lead plaintiff, but then a number of other people who um, are atheists in the state or members of the Freedom From Religion Foundation and are concerned about registering the vote. Um, with this with this form, and so uh, you know we had um, four plaintiffs uh, in total from different parts of the state. Um, we actually heard from a number of other people concerned about it, but really people who might have to register again to vote. Um, I think at least with our other uh, three plaintiffs, they had at least at some point registered in Alabama. And I know um, Randall hadn't um, hadn't registered at least as of uh, you know the time of the filing this case, which was in October, so just before. You know, big presidential election in in 2020 is when, um, you know, is is when we uh, brought the case. Um, and so, why I guess why we're talking about this today and why it's timely. You know, this issue had been in the news recently, our case um, for for some good reasons. You know, that we had actually made some um, some progress. So you know, it was covered in by the AP, which was in the Washington Post and AL.com. You know, the largest newspaper um, in Alabama, um, as well as um, the friendly atheists and others uh, kind of talking about it. And I know on Reddit, it was a huge uh, topic of discussion is uh, that after, you know, we had sued, the state had um, made some changes. And Randy, I don't know if you're um, comfortable about talking about kind of what your reaction is to that and also, you know, kind of what some of those changes are. We can we can go through some of those. Sure. Uh, so um, I'm not the attorneys. Uh, like you are, so you'd be better at describing those changes probably, but I'll try it. So the the state made put a, a box on the registration form that says optional, you can check this box. It doesn't say you can check this box. It just says optional. Uh, I, I'm choosing not to swear this oath to God to leave out the last four words. Um, that's not the exact wording, but it's in front of you. And uh, they also sent a, a new policy to the local election boards saying uh, that people who are trying to register to vote can cross out those last four words and nothing else, and that registration should not be rejected as a result of that. They also changed the online forms, as I understand, although I haven't looked at that one, to also add a box like that that's on the paper form. Um, but so as I understand it, this is sort of in line with what other states are doing. And oh, so I don't actually know if other states, you said that other states don't have any religious language on the forms themselves, right. but on other sorts of forms and on other sorts of oaths. Um, but my perspective is that this is really not the solution that I would like in the long run, and I think that for other people who face this, is probably also not the solution that they'd like in the long run. It doesn't feel good to be singled out, not singled out, but to be 
to have something on official forms that is essentially asking, what's your religion as a prerequisite for voting? Or do you agree to this statement that has nothing to do with voter registration as a prerequisite for being able to vote? And that's fairly absurd. Uh, so hopefully that'll change sometime. Right. We struggle with this. But with religious oaths in general, because it seems very obvious to those of us who um, do not swear to God um, in order to, like, affirm our veracity. But, like, it seems obvious that the default oath should be secular um, when we're talking about signing and affirming things in, you know, in public life um, for the government, right? Like, you shouldn't have to opt out of a really specific religious way of <laughs> affirming um, truth. So it's frustrating. Right. I think, and that's the, you know, that's the result we wanted. You know, that would have been the great result is for them to completely take off that language. And then there's one form without any additional um, language or, or check boxes. I mean, I think the, all, the result that we have is a good result, but not a great result in that sense, you know, that there's still more fix, there's still a broader fix, um, you know, in terms of what Alabama could do. I mean, I mean, in terms of the legal context of our case, you know, it was really a challenge to the required aspect of taking an oath. And so in that sense, I think we've made a, a beneficial change for a lot of people, um, you know, who could register to vote. I know two of our plaintiffs, um, Heather um, Coleman and Chris Nelson have since registered to vote with the new forms. I believe they did that recently, um, you know, just in, in March of this year. So they were able to take advantage of the new forms um, already. But yeah, the ultimate fix is for the government not to be in the business of putting out religious oaths and signaling, um, you know, sig signaling people out in, in, in some way. Um, but I think, I think we've made progress. I think, you know, because of your um, advocacy and because of the work of FFRF, you know, we've made some progress. But certainly there should be a, there should be a long-term fix. And, and I don't know when that will, um, you know, I don't know when that will finally come. But I hope, I hope that there can be further changes to how, you know, something as important as registering to vote. It, it shouldn't involve, um, it shouldn't involve, you know, these kinds of um, religious statements in any way. Right. And given what I think in the reality of, um, the, the legal context and what we could compel a court to f make Alabama do, um, starting from where they were, which was telling Randy, no, you absolutely have to sign this form as is, or your registration will be rejected, to them affirmatively, like, signaling on the form that there is a secular alternative um, to register to vote right, right here, right now, and you don't have to, you know, Call, any, call anyone up to find out or, you know, take any other pains, um, and sending along the memo to all the county registrars to educate them about how to handle someone who's in your situation and letting them know, um, you know, the decentralized, like, nature of voting in a place like Alabama makes it so um, we've heard a, from a lot of people over the years who are told by their local county voting official that they have to swear um, a religious oath to. So I do think that um, this really made a lot of progress in Alabama, given the landscape um, that, we're, that we're working in. Right, and I, I guess we're curious, I don't know if you've, um, I know that there aren't immediate elections in many places in Alabama right now, but if you, have you registered to vote on any of these new forms or are you intending to do that anytime soon, Randy? I was planning to do that on Monday, um, and I was at the a place where I would have done that, uh, but I ran out of time. So hopefully later this week. Yeah, and hopefully, um, you know, you know, I say that we've made some changes here, but it did actually require the state to do quite a bit that is in the background that a lot of people don't know about that they had to take bids on reprinting all their forms and mailing them, and I don't know the final cost and tally, but certainly I think the state officials realized it was indefensible what they were doing and that they were going to have to do um, some form of change. And so I think hopefully wherever you, um, when you do go there and you are new forms, you can feel partially responsible certainly for um, making those, uh, you know, making that change at least happen because the state did have to take some pretty big steps um, in changing their administrative rules um, and changing their online interface as well as all the actual printed form. So I think, um, you know, I think you've done well in, in making some positive change there in, in Alabama. Yeah. Well, good. 
it's cool. And it takes um, it takes a plaintiff because uh, because obviously we the, the cool nuts not cool devastating nuts and bolts of like this lawsuit is it's not that different from what Patrick tried to do without filing a lawsuit, which was bringing to the attention of the Secretary of State of Alabama the legal problems with what this Alabama resident, Randy, is being told by your office, um, it's unconstitutional, you should change your policy. That didn't happen without, you know, that extra push of, um, of filing a lawsuit. And in order to do that, there needs to be a willing plaintiff to, to step up and really be the face of that. So um, that is really cool, because um, what happened in this lawsuit is, you know, it didn't—we didn't file motions, we didn't go to a—, a a trial, you know, nothing. We didn't even do discovery and, and you know, have an evidentiary back and forth. It was literally just the pressure of filing a lawsuit that really kicked um, things into gear. And this was, you know, agreed upon um, course of action by the Secretary of State's office once they were facing a lawsuit. So um, it meant a lot in this case. Ju the only thing that happened was we filed a lawsuit because we had a plaintiff with a stake. Uh, in Alabama. So thank you, Randy. Yeah. Thank Thanks you for, for your support. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. So this is a good place to let you go, Randy, if you have uh, better things to do than uh, sit around and listen to me and Patrick talk about oaths <laughs> for the next few All minutes. Right. Um, so well, thank you so much for having me. We thank you very much for your activism and for, you know, being the, being part of the Alabama free thought community down there. Thanks so much. All right, bye, Randy. So um, me and Patrick are just going to kind of zoom out and talk a little bit more about uh, religious oaths in general, because uh, as you kind of get the impression from us talking about this lawsuit, we have heard from a lot of people over the years in Alabama and other states about um, being confronted with religious oaths when they are going about public life, uh, you know, d signing things and um, filling out forms for the government. So, uh, Pat, w what are some of the, like, other ways over the years that we've heard about or our, our complainants and plaintiffs have been confronted with religious oaths like this, besides voter registration? Right. Yeah, there's a few um, contexts, and actually probably, you know, viewers have maybe encountered it in some of these areas that I'll, we'll kind of go through where it comes up most common. Um, you know, one is courtrooms, you know, swearing in uh, witnesses um, or jurors um, is one place where we hear about, you know, potential problems where a person felt like they couldn't, they didn't have an option to opt out. And so certainly, um, and Liz, I know you've dealt with this, uh, that specific context a number of times where we've worked with court officials sometimes to say, oh, you know, you need to make sure that this is a, an option. And so unfortunately, sometimes in that context, the, the witness or the juror may have to let somebody know ahead of time if it's a bailiff or if it's their attorney. Um, that's usually the better way to handle it is so it's not a surprise for them when they um, are sworn in in some capacity. So that's usually where, um, you know, we hear about that um, in that context and we've made progress in a number of places and changing it. Um, licensing. So um, I know in, this was a number of years ago, I think I had helped work on changing New Jersey teacher registration forms um, where they had to you know, certify or affirm certain things where they didn't have a secular option at the time. They had only, you know, kind of the so help me God um, language without a secular option. And so I know we've, we've made progress in changing some of those. So licensing, personally, I've been impacted by that. And, um, you know, lawyers have to be licensed. So um, licensed in Wisconsin, but also in Minnesota. In Minnesota, when I had reached out to the bar and said, I can't take, you know, the oath that you have, they didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> um, you know, like, there's like no, no attorney in the history of Minnesota has come to them and said, I can't sign the religious oath. I need to do something else. So they have a right. statute that says what you do in that instance. You can you can affirm uh, without a religious statement. So I, I think a lot of people do not what Randy did is they kind of go along with it because it's not that big of a deal. Certainly, if you're an atheist, you might not um, you know pay that much attention to it. But um, you know, but I paid attention to it a number of years ago, and was able to you know get the form changed so I could um, you know register. Um, you know, so that's some of the main. Um, you know, some of the main areas. And then another one that FFRF has dealt with, which you probably know is, um, 
you know, which I think is a very personal and important thing, is people becoming citizens um, via like a naturalization ceremony. Um, you know, it's a really important moment for people, for their families, and they may not know how to handle the oath that's provided there because it would often default to, you know, the I swear and the so help me God um, language. And so FFRF has complained about that in some, in some contexts, and I'm sure a number of people have complained, both religious and non-religious, because some religious people, because of the Bible, refuse to swear an oath. Right. Um, and, and that has come up in, um, you know, in a number of other, in a number of other contexts, but I believe it's the, um, the, uh, uh, in the, in the naturalization, um, ceremony, they even have the citizenship and immigration service even has like a guide on like what to do on if people object. And so it's kind of funny that, you know, that even says the testimony or evidence, it's not required. Person just has to, you know, substitute solemnly affirm, um, and they don't say this, so help me God at the end. So, uh, clearly this comes up in some of these, um, other contexts. Um, this is from the, um, you know, from the government's uh, own website on explaining, you know, people getting out of the, the, the oath portion. And we get questions about it at FFRF. Um, but it's kind of personal to me because I know people who've taken the naturalization oath and have gone through that process. And it's, it's, um, a little, disappointing that the start of becoming U.S. citizen is going to, is going to be with this religious statement I know. that seems so against, uh, you know, the Constitution and the, and the First Amendment. But people should know that that's an option to, to opt out. It's so, like, that context is so especially, like, disappointing and upsetting because it's just extra insensitive because we're, you know, welcoming new citizens from hopefully anywhere and everywhere. And like, this is supposed to be the secular, like the first secular nation on earth. And uh, we still default to this religious oath. Um, but I wanted to, um, so we're talking about like the factual ways that we see oaths come up in people's lives. What are we talking about um, the legal and constitutional rights that are implicated? What's FFRF complaining about when we um, see these oaths being required of people by the government? There, there's actually a couple of different, um, you know, constitutional problems, at least the ones that have been most litigated or most referenced or the ones that we've referenced in our, in our cases. Um, you know, one is a free speech problem under the First Amendment because there's, you know, quite a bit of cases basically the government can't uh, compel speech or compel a statement, a patriotic statement or a religious statement. Um, so that's one of the chief problems with making somebody swear uh, a religious oath. And then, um, which is more common for, you know, FFRF to deal with, um, you know, it can be an establishment clause problem and also a free exercise problem under the First Amendment to coerce somebody to make a religious statement or to do what they believe is a, a religious practice or a religious statement. Um, and that has been litigated in some cases. Actually, coincidentally, in Alabama, um, you know, that's where we took this most recent case. But they had a case in 1972 on behalf of an attorney who said, I can't swear the religious oath to become an attorney in Alabama and had to fight the state bar or the state you know, board um, on that um, in order to be able to become an attorney because he wasn't willing to uh, swear the religious portion of it. And the court ruled that, yes, he had a right under the First Amendment to um, abstain from that oath. And he was willing to do, which is all what we really offer is to do some kind of secular affirmation to say that, um, you know, he'll abide by whatever rules, but he's just not going to do it on, on a religious basis. Um, you know, the Supreme court had a, had a famous case, which isn't exactly on the same circumstances that Torcaso, uh, versus Watkins, which is from, uh, I think, you know, the 1960s, you know, there was a, to be, a, I think it was to be a notary. You had to, to swear belief in God. And the Supreme Court, uh, you know, ruled that that was unconstitutional. So there's kind of this um, general body of, of cases, whether it's free speech or whether it's under the religion clauses, that the government is not going to be able to force somebody to make a, a religious statement. And so there's pretty good um, sound principles, constitutional principles behind um, somebody you know, not being forced to do that. Yeah, it's such a, like— um, thinking back to the Torcaso case, which is from the 60s, when the, the courts striking down a required oath to become a notary public, 
Um, and it's almost one of those cases where the court doesn't really zero in and, and do that structured analysis under one constitutional right. It's just this, it, it almost just has this, uh, it just offends like the constitutional principles of, of so many different parts of our constitution. It's speech, it's, you know, it's compelling a belief and it's, you know, you're being required to swear something. So it implicates religious, um, freedom. Um, but I'm wondering what you think, and I'm I'm just like riffing here because I can't remember back to Torcaso, but Randy kind of alluded to this when he was talking about how it felt for him um, having to have the religious oath be um, like the test. Like, do you think religious test for public office as obviously a principle of our constitution that's like being offended by these types of requirements? And has that been litigated? And what do we what do we do with that theory? Yeah, I, you know, I'm not the foremost expert on on that. And maybe the reason why is it hasn't been litigated all that often. I know that we've included it and some other courts have referenced it, I think, in talking about the the principles um, of it being a problem, you know, no religious test for public office or trust. So it seems that that Torcaso case is hitting almost exactly on it. You know, that was a um, you know, kind of an official position that had a religious test. Uh, but for the most part, it hasn't been, um, you know, a primary, uh, a prime on the forefront of the court's decisions. I think it's used, um, I think it's used maybe more to enlighten the other principles within the First Amendment. So I think it's a, it's probably correct that um, the religious test clause itself is being violated with some of these rules or some of these states that might try to implement it. Uh, but usually the courts are maybe taking the easier route and and looking at it more from a the you know free exercise clause or the free speech clause of the First Amendment is how they're often actually deciding the cases. But we, you know we've brought claims before involving um, that claim. It's just usually the courts have taken the easier road, I think, to um, to decide the issue. Right on. Um, I was really interested just to hear that it struck him that way. I think like that really resonates with people when it's like you're having to signal your religious um, belief as like um, the hammer that like makes you tell, tell the truth um, in, in public life. Like it's just a religious test to show that you're honest and you can be a voter or a witness or a juror. And so I think like it's interesting to hear that that's how plaintiffs are experiencing um, the violation of their rights as like a religious test. Um, so I was curious what you thought about that. Um, well, I'm very proud of this case, Patrick. We have no viewer questions today, so I guess I'm going to eat lunch early. But um, uh, I just want to say I'm super proud of this case because this is kind of the ultimate goal of uh, how litigation works at, uh, for us, which is we file a case and it provides a... Um, gentle but you know, fast moving pressure for government entities to cooperate with us to resolve constitutional issues. And so that's what happened here. Uh, you filed a great lawsuit and we had great plaintiffs with a serious stake um, registering to vote, you know, in their state. This is super serious uh, injury. And so, um, and then you filed in October negotiated with uh, the Secretary of State's office over what needed to be done. They did it and it was resolved by April. So that's pretty good. So hats off to you. Yeah, thank, thank you. It was a team, team, <laughs> team effort, certainly on behalf of, on behalf of everyone. Um, and I know that some of the reaction is, you know, again, I think I agree with people that it was a good solution, but not great. So maybe there's more there's more progress certainly to be made, and, and hopefully, um, you know, the long-term fix could happen at some point where that gets removed completely. But for now, people can register without this being an obstacle. I think that's a, a good um, compromise for now. Yeah, and they know it. Um, you know, it's they know that they can register right there on the form, so we don't have to have, um, you know, people who can't swear in good conscience to God don't have to go ferreting out what their rights are or worrying about if they can cross it off and get away with it. It's just it's just as easy for them to register as everyone else. And so that's no small thing. Well, thank you, Liz. I should get my microphone. 
Thank you, Liz. And thank you, Patrick, for a great show. Uh, the show was recorded last week, but um, I'm sure you both are watching it now, uh, this week live. So there are some questions, but let me just tell you a quick story related to all of this. I, um, uh, when Annie Laurie and I got married back in 1987, we had a free thought feminist wedding all planned out. We're both atheists. We went down to the county and the clerk we had, to, we had to register for the marriage license, and the clerk said, so do you swear to tell the truth, so help you God? And we both laughed, and we said, um, we, we are atheists. We, we don't believe in God. We can't, we can't swear to take that oath. Uh, and she, she was all flustered. She says, oh, well, no one's ever asked me that before. Um, and we said, well, we, uh, we, you can take an affirmation. In the state of Wisconsin, you don't have to take the religious oath. So she kind of riffled through her pages, and then she said, oh, okay, well then, do you affirm to tell the truth, so help you God? <laughs> we had to object again, and we said, look it up in the statutes. She finally found the statute, and it says you can affirm that you're telling the truth under the pains and penalty of perjury, it said, which means that if you don't believe in God or a hell, that's all you need is to say, so help me God, but if you don't believe in God, then... You have to be reminded of the, of the penalties of the law, as if you wouldn't be necessarily be a good person. We thought it was funny. We finally signed the marriage license. Uh, so we do have some questions. Um, we have um, Craig Reinecke, who, uh, who's been watching the show. He says, lately I've been looking at secular celebrants. Is it a job like a priest? Do they have a church? Do you have any insight about how to become one? So, yes, there are some secular celebrants, and I know that uh, the American Humanist Association has, or had, I think you can look that up, AHA, a way that you could actually become registered with them as a, what have you called it, celebrant or an efficient? And, um, and I was one for a while, in which case you can perform weddings and, and memorial services and such. Uh, but each state is different. Here in Wisconsin, since I was an ordained minister, my ordination is still valid, even though I'm an atheist now. I've been performing weddings here in Dane County. And on the license, it doesn't even say minister, reverend, or anything. It just says officiant. So I've been performing them, and I've just been signing them as an officiant. So um, it's, it's you know, he you ask me if it's a job like a priest, um, I'm pretty sure there you can charge for it, you, you know, but it would be, I don't know if you can make a living doing this thing full time. And I don't think there's any actual church called Secular Celebrant Church. Maybe you could start one, Carl, but uh, it is possible to do that. So you can, you can conduct your entire life as a secular life. We have a question from Heather Johnson. Does the Freedom From Religion Foundation offer or recommend any trainings we can attend to stop these cases before they start? Well, trainings, um, we have information you can use. If you go to our website, ffrf.org, and look under legal, we have a huge list of FAQs, frequently asked questions that you can scroll down to, to see if there's a, if you think there's a violation happening in your community, your county, your school, your state, uh, your post office, you can uh, you can check our FAQ to see, well, is this something I can complain about or I should complain about? Sometimes you can't. Sometimes what they're doing is legal, but usually if you if it's bothering you, it's probably a problem. So go to that site and uh, read all up on that, and then you'll be thoroughly trained. And then uh, we recommend, of course, that you make a complaint to your your local official, whoever's doing the violation. Make a complaint to the teacher, to the principal, to the superintendent of the district, or to the mayor, or to the county executive, whatever, you write that complaint. Today I was interviewed by North Dakota Television about the fact that the, their governor signed into law a bill requiring or allowing the Ten Commandments in public schools. And he asked, how can you outside Wisconsin group come into North Dakota and tell us how, how we live our lives here? And I responded, well, we're not doing it. We can only act when a local North Dakotan, a student in the school or a parent or a family, 
sees the problem and complains about it, and maybe that family doesn't want to be public, but we can represent them. So it's not it's not us coming into your state from outside. It's you. It's you're the local person. You're seeing the violation. You're affected by it in some way. You're the one who has the what they call legal standing. You're the one who has the injury to go to the court, and then we can then represent you uh, either as co-plaintiffs or as legal counsel when you do complain. So that's what we do. And of course, these people who complain about us outsiders coming in with legal force uh, are very quick to employ an outside Christian or religious legal group to help them. It doesn't bother them that they're going to Texas or to Florida to get legal counsel uh, to help them to defend the violation. So, uh, uh, Craig again. Craig is asking another question. Is this public record where someone can find out how someone registered? I don't know that. I don't know if you can go online and look up if someone has registered. I know you can, in most states you can look up how, how you vote. You can look up to make sure that your ballot got there on time. It doesn't say how you voted, but I mean, you can, you know, it can show that you, in fact, did vote. I don't know about that. Uh, I wish Patrick or Liz were here. They're, they're smarter than I am on these legal things um, and on a lot of other things, too. Uh, and then a final question by Craig. Why not change, so help me God, to under penalty of perjury? Well, exactly. But the story I told you about Annie Laurie and I having to um, object to so help me God in the state statute in Wisconsin, there is that wording uh, that's secular wording under the pains and penalty of perjury. We think it, the secular affirmation should be first, and then if someone wants to, they can request a religious, so help me God oath. We think that's the way it should be. We're a secular country, but we allow for religious freedom. So in, instead of us being forced to object, the law should be the other way around, so that religious people will have the freedom to make it their own way. If they want to swear to Allah or to Mother Goose or to whatever they believe will solemnize uh, whatever they're doing. So, and no more questions, uh, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren Searing, for doing the questions. If there's no more questions, I guess that ends our Ask an Atheist for the week. And by the way, this isn't our only show. We have a, a weekly TV show called Free Thought Matters that broadcasts on many TV stations around the country on Sunday mornings. We call it the Un-Sermon. It's on Sunday mornings. This week, our guest on Free Thought Matters is the actor Alice Gretchen. She has a new book out. It's called Wayward, a memoir of spiritual warfare and sexual purity. Alice escaped an extremely conservative religious family. During the interview... Alice told us a story about how she was pushed down some stairs by an evangelical charismatic preacher who was trying to get her to be slain in the spirit when she was just 10 years old. I went up to receive prayer from Rodney Howard Brown, and he put his hand on my head, and uh, he was praying for me, and I kept waiting for the Holy Spirit to slay me, to knock me over, and nothing happened. And I was taking too long to fall. Uh, and I had not yet started faking a spirit slaying. And so he very forcefully just sort of pushed me down on these stairs. And, uh, I remember as a little kid looking up at him being like, like that's got, he surely he's about to apologize and he didn't mean to do that. But instead what I internalized was, um, what looked to me like a warning in his eyes being like, don't tell anyone that I'm the one who pushed you over and not God. <laughs> of course, it wasn't God who pushed her over, if that ever happens. Being slain in the Spirit means that the Holy Spirit hits you so hard that you just fall over, and sometimes you need somebody to catch you, uh, which is pretty crazy. She was honest enough to admit that it was all nonsense. And you, you might have seen Alice Gretchen in some movies, some Hollywood movies. You can see her full interview with us this week on our broadcast TV show, Free Thought Matters. If you want to know if it broadcasts and when and where it broadcasts in your area, check out our website for the stations and the times. Go to ffrf.org. Or you can see our Free Thought Matters shows right now on FFRF's YouTube and Facebook channel. Just go to YouTube uh, Free Thought Matters playlist and you'll be able to find 
what is it, Bruce? More than 120 shows now, 100, almost 130 shows that have been. Yeah, something like that. What? About, about something like that. Yeah, so you, you you spend your whole day watching them. Uh, also, don't forget about our radio show. Uh, we have a weekly show called Free Thought Radio, radio for the rest of us. You can check that out at ffrf.org slash radio. And then, of course, we invite you to become a member of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, or you can just contact us and ask for a sample issue of our newspaper. Just go to ffrf.org. So that's the show for today. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next week on FFRF's Ask an Atheist. <laughs>